Okay, so here is an um, um, example of the response surface methods with the, like in reality, what are gonna, what are we gonna do? So let's say you're working in your research or in your lab, uh, in the lab, and then you have, this is the objective. The objective of the experiment is to find conditions of reaction time and reaction temperature that maximize the yield of the chemical reaction. So you have this one and you know that from the similar situation that the nominal conditions um, are like T equal to 75 and T equal to 75 minutes and 130 degrees centigrade. Um, and you know the range could be like 10 minutes first as a starting point. And then the other one, the range can be uh, five degrees centigrade. This is the information that you have. And you want to really develop the response, like you want to develop your design of experiment. Um, and like going through the different steps of the response surface methods. In my opinion, this is one of the best examples that I've ever seen. Um, it's coming from a book and um, it's Box, Box and Hunter. No, Box, Hunter and Hunter and it's like from 1976. Um, but it's like, and I added something to the note so it's gonna be um, to like the details of each step how would we calculate it? Step one, um, taking as a starting point, the best condition known, you wanna design a two by two factorial. When you say two by two, it, it's the same as two power two factorial, varying time from 70 to 80 uh, minutes and temperature from 127.5 uh, and 132.5. It's like this, we added just this range to the two parts of it. Like we said that range is five so if my nominal condition so the nominal condition it's like the center points for us when we are um we, when you want to develop your um like design of experiment go to the uh, response surface method and then we would include the replicated center center points as nominal condition as written here so we would uh, please observe that we are designing first a simple two power two uh, factorial around the nominal condition. We don't know what's the optimum condition here and we are hoping to find it. So, and this is the coded variable. So we will say x1 is time minus 75. So divided by five, it's like that x1 is equal to uncoded minus the average, right? Divided by the range, divided by two, like half of the range. And we would have it this one for time and this one is for, it's going to be for temperature. Then we are going to write down the runs that we would have. Like it, this is very similar to the one that we had before. So I'm going to have like, let's say four runs and let's say we are going to consider like at the beginning consider like three to five center points. And as I said, this is your experience. Like you want to develop it. Your hand is open here that if you want to consider three runs for center points or five runs for center points, it depends that when you consider this one, you need to run the experiment and get the result. If you don't have any, um, like let's say you're working in your lab and there's no limitation of the number of the center points that you can run, so consider five, it's okay. So it's gonna help you to have a better pure error. But I, here I consider the minimum one, like three ones here. Um, and then we have the minus one, like different, like the coded ones that we had before, uh, like minus one and plus one. And then you, you are gonna run your experiments and these are the yield that we get. Let's say we did it and we got these ones. As I said, so this is when you wanna run the experiment in, your, um, in the lab. So it's like that you're gonna run it and you're gonna get the yield. Then what you're gonna do, so in parentheses, if I wanna ask you in your, in, for assessment, I'm gonna provide this data for you because we can't run the experiments for the exam, right? And then we would have fit, fit the first degree polynomial. And first degree polynomial is beta null plus beta one x one, beta two x two. And at the beginning we said that it's just the main effects. We don't consider any interactions. And then for the average of the all, the, uh, from the average of all data, we're gonna find out, find, find out the beta null. And from the half of the effect, 
Do you remember we were adding like the effects and we we'll say that the average of the positive one, positive one minus the average of the negative one, or we would say contrast divided by the divisor. Both uh, methods that would give us the same answer. And then when we find out the effect of the like x1 or the effect of x2, we are going to find out the half of it and find out beta 1 estimate and beta 2 estimate, right? And then we can write down our first degree polynomial model. Here is the y estimate is, for example, 62.01 plus 2.35. This one, x1 plus 4.5 x2. Just be careful, this is x1 and x2, they are a coded value. So if you want to change it to the uncoded, you would need to put the um, like uncoded equation for the instead of x1 and x2. And you can find out a regression model like this. Um, when you put the regression model, you can find out the y1 estimate. Um, and then when you find out y1, so for finding out the y1 means that for run one i'm going to find out the yield like estimate from my model what i do most of the time um let me see if i have my papers here um what um uh, what i do i wanted to show you that how i work with these ones it's like that i just write down the estimates next to my table like i would say here y estimate and then i would write down all of the um numbers the main reason that i do that is that if you write down here, like instead of writing now 55.16, 59.86, um, here, if you write down here, you can get the deviation between them, square them, add them, and then you are, you are gonna find that sum of square of residual. Um, it's up to you, that's what I do. Um, it's gonna reduce the amount of the typo that I might have. So you, we can find out the y estimate from this model or from this model, it doesn't matter. As long as you can see that if you want to consider negative one and plus one um, or zero zeros, like the, all the zeros that you would have go with this. If you want to consider the real value of the t time and temperature, so you would need to go with this one. But most of them is going to give you the same answer. So I have the y estimate. I'm going to use these y estimates later for finding out the um, sum of the score of error or some of the score of the residual, they're the same, right? To get the lack of fit value. We're gonna look at it. Um, so look at here. Let's find out the pure error. So from the three center points, we are gonna find out the um, variance and then estimate for variance, and uh, which is equal to S2 and is four. We have three center points, so degree of freedom um, of pure error so far is gonna be two. And then, we know that for the um, standard error, a standard error is the, look at here, generally speaking, when we are talking about a standard error of the point, it's gonna be like the square root of the variance of it. So I have the variance like this, and for this case, when we are talking about beta null, because beta null is intercept, um, we would say that beta null is intercept, in fact, it's like, the, we said that it's the average of y, right? So it's the average of something. So what are we gonna do? We had this equation before that the variance of the x bar or like the average of something is gonna be sigma two of for that one divided by n. So here, what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna use the same equation and I would say the standard error for beta null because beta null is the average of y. So it's gonna be the square root, like the square root of the variance, like divided by the number of the, um, runs that I have, like the total number of runs that I have, which was seven. And then I'm gonna find a standard error of the beta null. That's for beta null. For beta one and beta two, because these are a slope, this is intercept, right? So for um, beta one and beta two, it's a little different. And when we wanna find it, we would use this equation. And we had it in chapter two, I believe, um, or at the end of chapter one. So we said that this is one of the properties of the variance. When we say the variance of ax plus by, in fact, x and y are like random like variables. We would say it's equal to a square variance of, variance of x plus b square variance of y. So here, when I'm talking about the variance of the beta one estimate, it would be equal to the variance of the, instead of beta one estimate, I'm gonna write down the equation that I had for it. Like we said that, get the like positive one, 
minus the negative one and then because we are looking that's going to give me the effect right half of the effect is going to give me the um, estimate for this um, parameter so i'm going to write down this one and then this one like one over two and these ones i'm going to get the factor of the one over two here so it's going to be one over four like this a2 squared that i have and then i need to square it and the rest of them i'm going to write down it's like that variance of this one plus variance of this one so it's like that four of them we are going to have and we said that if you remember that if we whether we had a positive sign or negative sign when we wanted to expand it here it would be the positive sign so it's like that you would consider four of them each of them the variance of them it was four um, so it would be four times four one over 16 so we are going to find out the you can see them value of it so it's going to be one so the standard error of the beta one estimate or beta two estimate it's going to be one um and then after we found that the um like the amount of the pure error and their standard error of each of these we're going to go and look at the interaction check so the value for the interaction so beta one to estimate it's going to be minus 0 0.65 um, with the same amount of the um, standard error. So in the parentheses, the minus plus that you see is the standard error. So this value, if you compare it with the effect, like the value that we can look at here, so the value we found that for beta 0, beta 1, and beta 2, they're really a lot bigger than this minus 0 0.65. So we would say there is no significant interaction between x1 and x2. Another um, step that we need to go is that, or the next step would be we want to check the curvature. So for curvature check, we have two options. Option one is that we are going to get the average of the co corner points that we have, and then we are going to find out the average of the center points. So we had it in the previous um, chapter. Then get the deviation of them, and then the difference between the like average of the corner point of the factorial points, factorial runs, uh, minus the average of the center point is gonna be, give us the estimate of the, whatever uh, curvature terms that we have, like we would add for the parameter of them. So here we're gonna get it like one over four, these are the, for the factors. If you go and look at the um, results of the runs that we had, so these are the first four runs. And this is the three runs that we have for the center point. So we're going to get the average of this one and this one. So the curvature, um, for the curvature check, the value of the beta estimate of the one one, which this one comes, it's for the x1 square, and this one is for the x2 square. It's 0 0.5. It's very small. Um, and then we can find out the standard error of them. So we would say there is no significant curv curvature. And so we can say the planner model that they have, um, it's adequate, like it's, you know. Mm, we have another option as well. So that was option A for curvature check. The second one is that we are going to use a model, a more formal lack of fit test. Um, as I said, you can go with this one or with this one. It's up to you. Um, for this one, some of us got off error here, some of us got off the residual, as I told you is that um, the sum of the square of the residual, so we are gonna find it from the estimated y and the observed y, and then sum of the square of the pure error, um, if we had the S2, we are gonna just times it by the degree of freedom that we would have, and then we say sum of the square of lack of fit is equal to sum of the square of the error minus sum of the square of the pure error. It's very similar to the one that we had in the ANOVA table. And it's gonna, we are gonna find the sum of the square of the lack of fit as 2.1186. Degree of freedom of the lack of fit is gonna be like the, for this one, whatever we had, like which was four, minus the, for the pure error, if you look at the previous page, you can see it's two, so it's gonna be two. And then we would say F, it's mean square of the lack of fit, divided by the mean square of the um, pure error, um, which is like the sum of the square divided by the degree of freedom, right? So we would say it's 0 0.26. It's very small, even you don't, it's less than one. When it's less than one, it means that whatever number that you find in the F table, it's gonna be um, greater than that. So we would say that there is no significant lack of it. So it's 
confirms what we got before. So then we are gonna, we will say, okay, so let's construct the first counterplot. So our simple model so far, which has been tested for its validity and found adequate is the first degree polynomial. So we have our first degree polynomial. Here is based on the coded one, we wrote it down. And then we can use this model to construct and visualize the counterplot as like the counter lines or straight lines. And in this case, look at here, when we are talking about the counter one is that we are gonna consider Y as a constant one, right? So it's like that we wanna derive it. What are we gonna do is that we say, okay, so let's say Y estimate minus these values is equal to zero. And then we can draw the counter line. So these are the lines that we would have based on the temperature and the time. And you can see these are the four runs that we had plus these three um, center ones and center points, which was seven ones, right? 